We are back for our monthly conversation um, hosted by the Wellbeing Project with the wonderful Sharon Salzberg and Parker Palmer, and would love to um, continue the conversation that we have been having um, now over quite a few months and with a particular focus today on the relationship between art and well-being. And we have an extraordinary couple of artists with us today to share both poetry and music and um, bring us into this space. And before we dive right in, um, over to you, Aaron. Um, thanks, Claire. Um, so we're really, really excited about this group. And part of this is about really the importance of art in our lives and our work. And so we're very excited to be exploring this topic. Um, we're also really excited to highlight this because we're hosting this summit later this year in June in Bilbao in Spain that's really meant to um, take the next step in catalyzing a culture of well-being for change makers. And we have woven art into the heart of that summit. It'll be a big part of the way that the summit actually happens, the way that we explore inner well-being and social change. And so bringing a real focus to it in this uh, session today was something that was important for us. Um, Alice, I think, on our team will be sharing a link to the summit in the chat. It should be an incredible moment in a number of different ways, and we do hope that you join us there. Um, Claire, I will pass it back to you. Thanks, Aaron. So before we welcome Jasmine Williams and Joshua Roman um, throughout this conversation, Sharon is going to help us center and um, start with a practice. So um, over to you, Sharon. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Parker, do you just want to say hello before we begin? Hello. Actually, say whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, dear. Hello. Yes. <laughs> Please lead us in a meditation. Good. Thank you. Um, I find listening one of the more profound and interesting things because course we do it all the time and yet do we actually listen so what we'll do in this exercise is is practice listening and i found that that involves a lot of letting go um not dismissing or disliking my thoughts um but really almost like putting them in the background or putting them to the side for now such as i can't write poetry i wish i could you know or gosh, I can't play, you know, why did I stop those lessons, you know, 30 years ago? Or um, uh, we may be listening to sounds that aren't so pleasant, sounds of the bus going by, and we think, why don't they change that schedule? I have some ideas, um, or whatever. Those thoughts may inevitably come, and that's fine. Rather than get entangled in them, even by judgment, let's just practice putting them aside and returning to the, the process of listening. So we can start, you can just sit comfortably, be at ease, close your eyes or not, however you feel most comfortable. And you can start by listening to my voice. There may be other predominant sounds. Whatever is strongest for you or clearest for you. And of course, we like certain sounds and we don't like others. But we don't need to follow after them to hold on or push away. Let them come, let them go. Unless you are responsible for responding to a sound, let it wash through you. And if there's no obvious sound, silence has its own kind of sound. And as you notice thoughts, judgments, comparisons, you can be aware of them can let them be, but let them be 
a little bit further away. As your interest, your enthusiasm, your energy can return to just listening to the sound. Or maybe your attention is lost in the task you left behind to get online here or what you're going to do next. If you notice that, it's the same process. See if you can let go gently and return to simply listening. If it's a steady kind of sound, the way my voice is now, see if you can be aware of it in process. Changes in being loud or soft, changes in pitch or tone, just to receive, to be aware of, rather than thinking, where's that accent from or whatever. We can't control what will arise as we simply listen, but we can connect fully. We can be very present. And we can let go of what's standing in the way. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes or lift your gaze and we'll end the meditation. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, I love the idea of getting things out of the way in order to listen, especially those voices that say, I can't write poetry or I don't understand music. Just let it flow. So alongside Sharon, I'm just delighted to be here with all of you and with uh, Jasmine Williams and Joshua Roman, uh, two really extraordinary artists, and I, I have to say young artists, uh, who really move me and thrill me with their work. And I know you're going to benefit greatly from hearing from them pretty soon here. Um, Sharon and I uh, had a wonderful conversation with Jasmine and Joshua the other day about the role of poetry and music in our lives. And I want to set the stage a bit for this conversation by saying a few words about poetry as a spiritual practice, which is what it has become for me over the years. And I can ground it quite immediately by telling you that about a BBC World News America program that I watched about three days ago, where they showed footage of a badly wounded Ukrainian woman, maybe 70 years old, she was lying in a gurney in a Ukrainian hospital. <clears throat> and the gurney was in the hall to keep her away from windows that had been exploding 
under mortar fire. Her head was swathed in bandages and the bandages were bloody. This woman motioned to the reporter and cameraman and with a slight smile on her face said, come closer, I want to tell you a poem. And these are the words she spoke from her own mind and heart. These stupid Russian shrapnel pieces I will carry all my life, but as long as I carry them, I will live and love. These stupid Roman shrapnel pieces I will carry all my life, but as long as I carry them, I will live and love. Now that's a poem that's not going to pop up in any college syllabus about poetry. But to me, it's an incredibly important document, uh, a simple poem that moves me deeply. For me, it illustrates one of the powers of poetry and music. It works alchemy on our experience, transforming suffering into hope and love and giving us a chance to assert with our own lives that life always transcends death if we let it. A poem like this is an act of courage, remembering that the word courage is related to the word heart. This woman, through these simple words, was putting her heart on display for the whole world to see. She was, in a way, doing open heart surgery on herself, which is what we should all be doing right now in the midst of this horrific world involving murderous conflict, deeply related to things that are going on certainly in my country and I expect in many other countries as well. The simple poem allowed that woman on the gurney to rise defiant in the face of death. One of the moments I love is when she calls the shrapnel pieces stupid. I love that, that word choice, which I'm sure was not conscious with her, but it allows her to rise above the ancient and overwhelming evil that those shards represent. They're stupid. The whole thing is stupid, she's saying to us. And maybe we can deal with stupid. Then of course, there's her defiant yet compassionate assertion that as long as she carries those shards, which she knows means the rest of her life, she will live and love. That poem is 23 words long, but it tells the story of an invincible human heart. And to me, that's a miracle multiplied. It's the miracle of the heart and the miracle of a compact story about the heart told in poetic form that moves me deeply and that is miraculous twice over. So for some sense of what I mean by poetry as a spiritual practice, it's through that poetic filter that I think we come to know each other at deeper and deeper levels and share messages that the world really, really needs to hear. Do we need all of the political science, all of the geopolitical science, and all of the analyses of the economic problems and tendencies towards totalitarianism that are driving all of this. Yes, of course we do. But if we don't have these stories of the human heart, we miss the whole point. We miss not only what other people's lives are saying to us, but we miss what we need to hear from within ourselves about transcendence and about resistance and about engaging the world with the fullness of our hearts. I'm gonna read one more poem that I won't tell the whole story of, but it's a poem I wrote 
at a time of deep suffering in my life that helped me heal, as I'm sure this woman's poem is helping her heal. I was in the middle of the second of three major descents into depression. I, was, I walked by a recently harrowed field out in the country, feeling in deep despair. A harrowed field is one recently plowed. And the word harrowing caught me as not only a description of what had happened in that field, but as a description of what was going on in my own life. And I'll just read this poem leave it without much comment and turn to Jasmine and Joshua to begin to reflect on what it is about art that nourishes and feeds our souls. Harrowing. The plow has savaged this sweet field, misshapen clods of earth kicked up, rocks and twisted roots exposed to view. Last year's growth demolished by the blade. I have plowed my life this way, turned over a whole history, looking for the roots of what went wrong until my face is ravaged, furrowed, scarred. Enough, the job is done. Whatever's been uprooted, let it be seedbed for the growing that's to come. I plowed to unearth last year's reasons. The farmer plows to plant a greening season. So with that in mind, Jasmine, Joshua, welcome. And I want to dive into that, that question. What is it about art that nourishes and feeds our souls? Where does, is it that art takes us, what, be it poetry or music? How is art a portal into another world that actually illumines our world and makes it more fit for human habitation. I invite either one of you to go first. Thank you. And also first, thank you for sharing uh, your beautiful words and the stories that you just did and Sharon for bringing us into a space together. Um, I'm very excited to be here to delve into these questions and share a little bit and hear Jasmine, uh, Jasmine's work as well. Um, I'm curious what Jasmine has to say. I, I think one of the things that really art impresses on me is this ability to connect what's inside with what's outside and what's come before and what's going to happen with the present. It really is a way of centering on the present while honoring the memories and the vision of the past and the future all while connecting, for me, art that really moves me manages to make me feel like it's speaking directly to me, even though I don't necessarily know the person who made it. So there's something very personal and universal at the same time. And so for me, it's, it's all of that to say, it's a meeting place right here, right now. That's what I feel. Through that place where we can all be together in, uh, in, uh this human connection. Um, yeah, echoing Parker, um, Josh here, I'm sorry, and your beautiful opening, Parker, and Sharon as well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, my connection and understanding to art is really similar to Josh's um, in that it creates a really unique space between, I mean, without, I don't know how, how much spirituality we can, well, we're here to talk about spirituality, right? Um, for me, art is a very spiritual place. I believe that we come from divine love and the ultimate space of love. And art for me is a container for that. I look at art as the fruit of love, right? I believe that it sits directly opposite of grief, right? If grief is no place for love to go, um, then art is the absolute opposite of that. And I believe that, um, you know, love isn't always a soft, cuddly thing, right? It can be pointy and uncomfortable and 
and strange and art has the capacity to hold all of that um, and reflect all of that back to us, you know, and expand our capacity for love. And that's, that's what it, it is for me. I'm curious to ask both of you as practicing artists, poet, a poet and a musician, um, to, to what extent are these thoughts with you as you create art or is the dynamic of creating art for you just coming from a different place? Are you already through that portal on the other side when you do it? How, how does that work out in your own art and craft? For me, when it comes to writing, so the way poetry was introduced to me is probably the way it was introduced to a lot of folks. A lot of flowery words, really soft, you know, these kind of really preschool sweet rhymes. Um, and when I started writing myself, there was this belief that my words also had to be very flowery and fluffy and soft and, you know, very squeaky clean. Um, but as I went along with it and started using writing as a spiritual practice, that's when I realized that, you know, my writing was about texture. You know, I needed to reflect the texture of my life as well. Um, and that's really what I carry with me when I'm creating is how much texture of the spiritual experience and of the human experience am I bringing into my work. Um, it's okay if a word is a little cringy or if it makes me a little uncomfortable. Um, sometimes that's what I need. Sometimes that's what I need to process. Um, but the point is about how honest I can be. I find that poetry, if you've ever been to a poetry slam, you'll hear folks yelling, get free, that tell the truth. Um, and it really is a contest of truth, of truth telling and who is diving the deepest um, into honesty. And that's, that's what I carry with me um, in my practice. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. I love that. I, I would add, I feel like part of the practice for me is recognizing and exploring the duality uh, of I'm trying to think about how to articulate this. And that's kind of a case in point. Um, the craft of art versus the freedom of art and living in that moment and expressing something and feeling connected. I, I, I think the, the moments where I feel the most connected are moments where I feel like a vessel but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm doing it in the most skillful way and there are other times when I've, I've really worked on something I've really worked it all out every detail every nuance is there but I'm not really tapped into something and so there's this constant forward motion this back and forth that moves something forward of how do I how do I stay aware of the details of expression while also tapping into something that comes from somewhere that I don't understand. And it's that that meeting point that I think drives creativity for me, uh, whether it's a piece that I've played a thousand times or an improvisational moment. I feel that connection. Sharon, your smile lit up in the middle of what these good folks are saying. What's what's going on for you in this conversation? Uh, a lot. It's all wonderful. I'm relating both as a person who is uplifted and um, helped by art and a person who writes. So I, I kind of relate related to both halves. And I think many of us may not be artists in, in the sort of uh, notion of it, you know, like we don't paint or we don't write poetry or we don't play music, but there is an artistic endeavor. There's something creative about relationships or uh, trying something different or actually expressing ourselves rather than holding back. So uh, I think we can relate as, as creators also. Um, the first thing I thought of was the last two years. I came up to Massachusetts, to very rural Massachusetts, uh, yesterday marked two years, you know, and I think about this time when so many people 
have lived in relative isolation or disconnection and what has furthered a sense of connection more than anything, um, which has been for me and for many, it's some kind of art uh, that we got to, in some ways, you know, enjoy more because there were fewer distractions. And in my case, you know, I haven't been on an airplane in more than two years, which is a miracle. Uh, and and so what do I do with that time? And And the things that have brought me closer to other people, it's a sense of empathy, a sense of connection, more than anything has been art. I also think about there's a kind of timelessness to art, you know, uh, to that process. Like um, if we create something, uh, maybe no one is going to see it right away, or maybe it's going to take a while, or uh, but it exists. It exists beyond us in in some way, and uh, and it, from the point of view of the creator, I relate so much to it. Joshua was saying, you know, uh, and before that, Jasmine, you know, it was like um, when I wrote this book called Faith, which was a very difficult book for me to write. It was more than 20 years ago. And I struggled quite a lot. Some of the best advice I got uh, was from a writing coach who said to me, you've got to stop thinking of yourself as the person writing this book and think of yourself as the first person who gets to read this book, like really get out of the way, you know? And, and you know, in terms of what Jasmine was saying, it, I, I find that um, people would say to me, just tell the truth. Because when you write about love or faith or, or something like that, at least for me, there's such a temptation to get very fluffy and elevated and highfalutin and you know, and it's dreadful writing. And and uh, it's so easy to kind of go up there. And and some of that, you know, back to Joshua is about craft. Like, remember, you know, uh, you don't have to say it in 15 words. Maybe you can say it in two. And, uh, you know, be simple. Tell the truth. Just reveal your heart. And that's the most important thing. That's a big thing, isn't it? To reveal your heart. In, in a culture that says never wear your heart on your sleeve, uh, keep play your cards close to your fist. It's really huge. And we might save the world if we revealed our hearts more often uh, with and for and to each other. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Maybe we take a next step into uh, our inquiry here with uh, Sharon. Well, I, I just want to go back for a couple of minutes to that same skill we were practicing in doing the meditation. It's um, realizing that there will be very likely intrusive thoughts. There will be comparison. Um, and uh, there will be self-criticism. Uh, there may be critique. Someone else, you know, whoever is providing the, the artistic endeavor rather than simply listening. Um, so many things may arise, but this is a place where we, we, explore, ba we explore balance, you know, rather than uh, elevating our thoughts and getting carried away and, you know, mentally signing up for 30 music lessons we will actually never do, or, uh, you know, resolving something that will never happen and, and just, uh, being lost in it, or on the other hand, getting entangled with judging our thoughts and disliking them and disliking ourselves. And why can't you ever listen? And why can't you be present uh, to notice those thoughts, to notice those feelings and just release? It's just releasing. And the way it's, it depends on the stance um, we take. Uh, somebody sent me a tweet the other day that somebody had written about her eight-year-old child and a lesson they got in school, which was think of your mind and your heart being like a pond. And there are all these fish in the pond. Your thoughts and your feelings are like the fish. See if you can be the pond and not the fish. And then the person ended her, her tweet with, boy, primary school is better than it used to be. 
you know, so it's a little bit like that. All these things will arise. It's okay. We just practice letting go and actually arriving more fully or back more fully to where we are. And so with that, I'm wondering, uh, Jasmine, if we might hear a poem or two. Yes. Um, I would like to share a poem that comes from a documentary I was a part of um, called Invisible Portraits. Um, Invisible Portraits uh, dives into the history of Black women specifically in America in a four part segment um, that was shared on Oprah Network. It's available on Amazon Prime um, and Discovery Network. Um, but I want to share this piece um, in particular because the process here um, was very therapeutic and in diving into the history um, without any further ado. Resilience is the black girl magic they can't rip off of me. I've spent far too many lives perfecting the art of survival. I have mastered mixing the perfect shade of red over split lips I chewed silence into. I tuned my laughter like a violin in office break rooms to drown out the screaming of token blackness I couldn't fully swallow like flagpoles and statues. I have climbed corporate ladders and rang the alarm from the top. I've been handcuffed on my high horse without flinching, I've learned what shadows to dust over swollen eyelids that squinted prayer all night for sons with bandanas in their pockets and for sons with skittles in their hoodies. Overlooked for a wife, I married myself to education and travel. Went to bed with wine on my tongue and isn't she lovely playing from my nightstand when the terror of burning crosses began to visit me in my sleep. I urged myself to dream from balconies in every corner of the earth. Dedicated the sum of my life to the fingertips of ancestors touching lands of their wildest visions, redefining what it means to be grounded, reclaiming my roots and my limbs these days. I wrap my arms around great oaks that used to haunt me with visions of blood on their leaves and nearly break down at the miracle of me still standing like a tree that should have been destroyed by the floods and the fires and the feds, but by some black girl magic, I am still here. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite everyone on this session to put into the chat something that you heard or how you heard as Jasmine gave us that beautiful poem, powerful poem. Let's just see what the collective hearing can yield. You know, I think for me, um, and maybe I can invite Sharon and Joshua also uh, to chime in on this. I think one of the things that happened, Jasmine, as I listened, was I went through that portal and felt in that space where, as Joshua said earlier, we can, we can all meet to some extent and in some way, felt connected with a life journey which is not my own, which can never be my own. Um, I occupy my own skin and that dictates so much of the limits of my experience. But that poem invites me once again into a world that illuminates the world I live in and, and which helps me take a next step in the world I live in, a step that deeply respects the kind of experience that you record in that poem. 
um, that it's easy for me to miss in my daily life. I, I, can, I can hold it in my head intellectually when I'm thinking big thoughts about our society. But in my daily actions and interactions, it's easy for me to just forget that that experience is reality for millions and millions of people. And so my gratitude for the way in which, the way in which your poem opened that space through personal testimony, you know, through taking me to your dreams and your nightmares. Um, it's a hard thing to pin down, but I feel it very deeply. Uh, lack the language to fully express it at the moment. I'll have to write a poem about it. <laughs> Love that. That's my favorite way to respond to poetry. <laughs> um, and, and thank you for receiving, receiving that. I could echo what Parker said. I also, I'm just thinking about the ways that I connect to words. I'm not a, not a poet and I love what words do. Words are so powerful and they're so different from music. And for me, in my experience, hearing things that awaken parts of my brain that think of that word in its context and there's a there's a book i think it's by milan i'm not going to say the last name right kundera uh but talking about how we all different chapters talking about how we'll say one word but it'll conjure up different things to do to two different people and graveyard is one of those cemetery is one of those words that's brought up in there and for one of the characters it's a place of peace of connection with the past and for the other one it's a very frightening scary place and that's something that I admire about the skill, your craft, is that you start with a feeling. I feel what's behind it, I think, because you're so good at choosing words that get past that, at crafting sentences that awaken something in me that actually does relate to your experience and sort of brings about that moment that Parker's talking about where maybe I'm connected to your experience in that moment and just listening to your words and feeling myself go back and forth between being able to hear what the actual word you're saying and then having what that brings up sort of flood the moment for me that back and forth I love that and that's something that makes me just want to revisit those words again and again and get more accustomed with the rhythm and the rhyme of your experience as, as you put it into words. As, and so I'm just saying, I think that I appreciate um, what's behind it and also the way with which you give us that experience. It's so colorful and so rich. So thank you. Thank you. You're very textured to use Jasmine's word. There we go. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. And and it also reminded me of um I when I was working on that same book, Faith, which was difficult for me. I was uh staying in a friend's apartment in New York City and She's an editor and she had a sign up over her computer, which said something like, uh, scare me, tell me the forbidden story. Mm. And I was in the midst of writing and I kept thinking, I'd rather not actually, <laughs> I think I'd like to go somewhere else. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, the uh, greatness of art in some way is, is that very willingness of the artist to to kind of go there which i think you did amazingly i also thought of the um in a way the tragedy of not hearing so many voices and the extraordinary gift of actually beginning to hear voices that don't necessarily reflect you know one's own um distinct 
individual experience. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to really second that. That's so important to me right now. And this and your poem, Jasmine, is the, the latest reflection of how important that is. I, I want to ask if in the writing and um, and and saying of that poem, the, the word healing works for you at all, and and in in what ways, if so. Yeah, um, writing this piece is was definitely very healing. It's a part of um, four poems. Um, and this chapter was called Resilience. And for me, this work, I think I do it because it's healing. Um, yeah, I think the, the more I can connect with the past and show my ancestors empathy and show my community empathy and visibility, um, the more healing I feel, right? I, I feel like it's very important to send love to people who are here with us as well as those who are gone, just to, to send them that love and to um, see them um, and to do the work of transmuting those stories and experiences into something um, that is art and is something that can be carried um, by their by their lineage and by their community. Um, so for me, it's it's very healing, and it's a it's healing in a community circle sort of way. You know, I, I for me, it goes um, beyond just myself. I feel whatever I contribute to my community, I I give to myself, um, and so it's really important um, to do that work. I think community healing is important, and that's what the arts is for me. And I, I think you've just really expanded the, the, the word listening for us, at least for me. We, you're listening to the ancestors. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we forget to do a lot uh, or don't know how to do. I, I'm now thinking of all the listening that we need to do to listen to the natural world, you know, to listen to the people we've never met and we'll never hear directly from how teachers in the classroom can listen to their students even when they're not speaking, mm -hmm. which they're often not because they're scared. Yeah. It just it goes on and on. Yeah. And I think, you know, our past speaks to us through the present. You know, we can look at the behavior of folks and what's manifesting in our current world and trace that back directly to someone's very lived experience 100, 200 years ago, right? We didn't get here by accident. Um, so I think when we start to really dive into that work, we start jumping timelines. We don't really have a, a choice but to connect with the past. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, both of you. And I know, uh, Jasmine, you may have prepared another poem, which I would actually like to close this a period with um and so thank you for that uh and then just to go on um you know something that i get asked a lot as a meditation teacher uh is about suffering and and creativity or art whereas you know people say to me i don't know if i want to get more balanced because i will lose my ability to create you know that i have to be like in the fire mm -hmm directly in order to um, manifest, you know, from that place. And clearly there's a kind of willingness to go to lots of places and to uh, not let fear overrun us and, and to bring those places, all of them, into what we create. But uh, it's just a very interesting question. It's a very Western notion that the great greatest creativity comes from the most anguish and you have to be in it. So in that case, you wouldn't be thinking about resilience so much as, you know, just the, the fire. And because I get asked that all the time 
uh, in one form or another. I don't know if I want to meditate, I'll get calmer and then everything will be bland and mediocre and I won't be able to access all these places. I would like to ask all three of you <laughs> to address that in some way. Who wants to start? I'll I'll jump in. I I've I've heard that. I've felt that when I was a kid, I was told that and I actually at one point put rocks in my shoes for a performance of something so that I would feel some sort of pain. <laughs> and I I've just gotten so tired of of that be, because while I think that suffering can bring about an empathy for somebody and an or an ability to articulate something and that's very true. I think that it's not it's not the important thing. That's not the thing that creates that connection. And so many artists, I feel, get caught in this trap. There's a quote that someone said to me a lot last year by Martha Graham, and, and a lot of artists live by this thing of this queer divine dissatisfaction uh, that keeps us going. And you know, I feel that, but that's not the thing that I want to lean into because that's just that's just purposefully causing myself more pain and that doesn't necessarily help me benefit anybody else again I think it's that connection and, and taking what you have your perspective and opening up to others and finding a way to to cultivate that and empathy can help a lot with that and a lot of people who suffer come out of it with more empathy than those who've never suffered. That part I think is undeniable. But to seek suffering uh, is uh, is another thing altogether. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, would have to agree with Josh and I in saying seeking suffering is a, is different. Um, I I'll say this. I think because art does come from a place of love and that love does encompass all things including pain um that it is an essential ingredient um for certain pieces right i think um the familiarity and a comfortability with pain um to an extent is required for empathy. Um, and I think that empathy is it's a special sauce in our work. I don't think that we can really skip over um, empathy and skip over stretching ourselves. And I don't think that all pain is has to be traumatic. I don't think that all pain has to be suffered. I think that part of our work is showing others how to survive these things. So if we don't get comfortable with being uncomfortable, and if we don't get comfortable with stretching ourselves, um, I think it really limits our work and it limits the impact that we can have on folks who are watching our stories or reading our books or our movies, right? There's very few people who um, are willing to do the work for the community in terms of diving into um, uncomfortable spaces in the human psych and uncomfortable spaces in the human experience. And artists, we do that. You know, it really is a, a labor of love in this work. Um, but, you know, all things in moderation. <laughs> there is too much of a good thing. Um, and keeping that in mind is really important. Um, I've definitely written myself out of dark spaces. Sometimes when I'm in a really low place, all I can do is write, right? I'm, I'm feeling manic. I'm feeling, you know, very depressed. I don't have a choice but to write. You know, that is the medicine, um, and it's not something I actively seek. But the the art is the lifeboat in those instances. Um, and yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend folks actively seeking that out though. <laughs> hey. 
Right, and I'll just say briefly, because I'm eager also to bring Joshua's musical voice <clears throat> into this conversation, as I know you are, Sharon, but I'll, I'll just say briefly, um, the woman in Ukraine whose poem I read, that, that represents the right relation between suffering and art for me. She suffered not by choice, but by circumstance, and she transcended it you know, with, with art, um, the ordinary everyday art that's available to all of us. And the poem I wrote about depression, which required me to work on it and work on it and work on it over weeks and weeks and weeks was, was part of my healing process from that particular depression. Um, I, the first thought that came to me when we raised the question with each other was, well, you know, on the, on the ground level, if I'm given a choice between <clears throat> ice cream and suffering, I prefer ice cream. So I'll just leave it, leave it at that, I think. That's fabulous. Thank you all. Joshua, uh, it would be wonderful to hear from you. Yes. Uh, so I have a couple of pieces that I wanted to share um, musically, and one of them I'm going to play for you in just a second here in the room on my cello, and then I'll share a video of the other one. And I'm not going to set the first one up too much, except to say that um, to tie this back into something that actually I think we were talking about the other day, we ended up when suffering came up, somehow we ended up on the topic of vulnerability. And I think about that a lot of being comfortable with being uncomfortable, as I think you, you said just a minute ago, and um, of being vulnerable and finding that thing which maybe scares us. And this is something that can be articulated in many different ways. And uh, sometimes it's just a daily thing that you do for yourself. It doesn't always have to be a grand gesture. And so the first thing that I'm going to play for you is something that I use for myself. I've known it since I was, I don't know, five or six years old. Uh, the Bach cello suites are like, they're the they're the thing for cellists. You can't not play the Bach cello suites. You cannot play other stuff, but you always end up playing these things. Every, every uh, famous cellist has put out at least one and sometimes up to four different recordings of these. And I think that there's a reason for that, which is that when you, I play this for myself over and over and over again, it really becomes less about what the music is and it becomes a kind of spiritual practice and a mirror into what's going on with me. The, the, the piece is so simple, it's so direct, uh, it's so uplifting, but every time I play it, and I've played this thing thousands of times, every time I play it, there's something different. And I check in with myself and see what's going on with myself. And it's not about playing it perfectly or projecting a certain thing. It's about seeing what's there. And that's only possible for me in this instance because I know this thing so well that I don't have to be concerned in the way that I might with something that I'm just learning. So that's how I'm setting up this piece, which is actually, again, very simple. And I'm pretty sure many of you, maybe even all of you will recognize. So I'm just going to switch cameras and walk over to the cello. And while I do that, maybe we can all uh, take a breath and reset for listening again. So here's some Bach.
So beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that is, yes, that is something again that I play for myself at least once a week and perform all of the time. And every single time I play it, my goal is to be open to what's there in a different way. And that's very different from, I think, the kind of, I don't know, pure creative process of originating new music in the moment. Uh, and so I wanted to share something as well um, that was original because that's become another important part uh, for me of being an artist. I come from a tradition that has evolved greatly over the centuries and in the last century has become so specialized that a lot of the creative impulses can feel divorced from the actual practice. That a lot of classical musicians, uh, myself included, focus so much on perfection of something that already exists that somebody else wrote, that we're not thinking so much about what we can put out there. And I started to incidentally challenge that uh, many years ago and during the pandemic had come to the point of thinking of myself as a composer already. And so I decided to embark on a project that I called a musical journal. And this was where I would take my cello into the recording studio, which was really just a bedroom at the time, and uh, just play what I was feeling, ask myself a question about what was going on in the world or personally, um, and just like a journal, attach music to a date, just music instead of words. And this comes from a period around Thanksgiving 2020, right? Yeah, 2020. And this was that next step for me in sort of a practice of looking at what's going on, not just playing something that I knew really well, but finding what was there. And this particular piece comes from a place of gratitude. So bear with me while I set this up. It'll just take a second to share the screen. Um, share sound, and this is from the Musical Journal. Thank you. 
Wow. <laughs> Were you about to say something, Joshua? Uh, well, it's just, sorry, it's interesting to see. I haven't watched that in a year. <laughs> and just to think about all that was going on back then. And yeah, it's, uh, I feel like I wrote that to address not only my gratitude to others, but to get, I had to do something for myself too so it's interesting it's so interesting joshua that um as as that piece drew me further and further in um it, the, the Camus quote came to me that in the midst of winter i found in myself an invincible spring and then i started thinking about all the people the healthcare workers and and so many others the the first responders the the necessary workers the the parents the teachers the list just goes on and on of of people who've reached deep in themselves um, through this long long pandemic uh, to move from that place of spring and gratitude rather than that place of, of despair that, that we all know. And there at the end, you, you expressed your gratitude to some of those folks. Um, just, again, we're in that, that we've gone through that portal with your music as we did with Jasmine's poem to a place where we can meet everybody, really. Um, if if we look around enough. So, so beautiful, Josh. I am so happy that you practiced this with it coming from a place of gratitude because it's such a great reminder of how rich the soil of gratitude is. It's such an abundant place to create from and it's so underutilized, I think, when we get distracted with um, the other parts of the human experience. I think gratitude is just, it's just such a place of light to come from. And it really, really translated itself in your work. I mean, it, I felt like I was having a sound bath the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> just tingles everywhere. Um, yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah, I'm not a professional matchmaker and I'm not asking you to swipe left or right, but I would like the two of you to consider some collaborative work. Uh, merging your arts you know yeah and, and Par would, yeah Par parker i might actually be able to do a plug uh on that because both joshua and jasmine will be in bilbao for the summit and so i think this might be we, we might take the cue from you on this one yeah well my commission is very small but uh, <laughs> but real but endless gratitude <laughs> <laughs> you will offer endless gratitude yeah wow Wow. And I was very touched to see the term loving kindness in the closing comments because it felt obviously, you know, my own life's work and just that universal reminder about love. I'm wondering, Aaron, if you want to, uh, if you have some questions that have come in and then we can close with the poem from Jasmine as the final moment of our, our particular gathering for now. I just want to say, if that's not the music that the angelic choirs sing when I get there, I'm going to ask my, for my money back. That's all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the pearly gates. <laughs> well, there's one question that just came in, uh, which we could share. Maybe I'll just turn this a little bit. Um, so the question is, how does one move from grief to gratitude? And maybe I'll just add the part, how can art support us? 
in moving from grief to gratitude? I, I can um, take a shot at this. I think art supporting us in moving from grief to gratitude. Um, so for myself, when I've experienced grief while working as an artist, it really allowed me to explore different memories and histories with whatever I was grieving. Um, it allowed me to take in and, and take a, a step back um, to see the totality of whatever it, it was that I was grieving. Um, and when it was all said and done, I appreciate it. I say that grief is the final act of love, right? And I think part of that is because you really understand, you really see something for what it is. You really recognize its value and its impact on your life. Um, And once that happens, you can't help but feel grateful for it. You can't help but reflect on that awareness with so much love and so much gratitude. Um, and that that was how art helped me um, in moving through through grief to gratitude. Um, that's that's my spiel. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that's thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's beautiful. I. I I have to say this one's a hard one for me and I tend to over intellectualize things like this but the core of what I experience is is that I feel to a certain extent uh I I I we maybe me for sure I'm always carrying grief it never goes away and when it comes up in a big way uh, something that has become a theme for me is that I realized that it's been there all along, that in a sense, um, it's a paradox that like you can't have life without losing life on, on its ver most very basic level. Every day that I've lived is a day I can't get back. And that's a very sort of me way of looking at it, but I think it's also a, a way to connect again to that bigger picture that focusing on the gratitude of today, of now, um, and making that, again, a practice. And without over-intellectualizing it, just getting used to that practice of being grateful for what is and accepting that because it's a, it's a constant process. And there are times when it feels overwhelming, but that doesn't mean that at the other times it isn't also there. And yeah, so I, I don't know. There are times when I think it's okay to be overwhelmed by it too, um, maybe. But the practice of acceptance and of gratitude is something that I, I don't want to wait until I'm overwhelmed with grief to be doing that. But I want to consider that every day is a moment to practice that gratitude and make that a foundational part of life. Yeah, yeah, amen. <clears throat> I just want to say quickly that for me as an amateur poet, um, I've written millions and millions of words of, of prose, but the words that mean the most to me are the words that have come out in those poems that, that I want, you know, that sort of claim me as truth about my life. And it's in the making of the poem itself that I, that I feel the first wave of gratitude coming out of my grief. Um, that I wrote harrowing in a period of profound grief, uh, many other words to describe the feeling of profound, long lasting depression. But Harrowing, when harrowing came up, and especially when I got to those lines that say, after all the harrowing I had done of my own life, enough, the job is done. 
whatever has been uprooted, let it be seedbed for the growing that's to come. I plowed to unearth last year's reasons. The farmer plows to plant a greening season. That, that word enough has a period after it. It just stands alone. It's not part of a line. Enough. The job is done. And I've often felt like when I wrote that word, I felt this wave of gratitude. And I think it was because, uh, to use Jasmine's word from a moment ago, I understood something about where I was, the condition I was in, and what the next step needed to look like. It, and there are so many next steps in life that just involve saying, enough. I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. Um, and and that, that was such a moment for me. And there was an energy in that moment that kept coming back as I worked and worked and worked to craft that poem. So for me, that's, the, that's how art helps to transform grief into gratitude. Thank you, Parker. And I think, Jasmine, this is where we can pass it to you for a closing poem. Um, Good. That works. I've made a decision <laughs> what I'll be reading today. Um, let's get into it. On the count of three, I'll anchor you while you reach back for me. A symphony of raised voices tend to first stir confusion, yet when we take a breath, before we send the text, we hear the whisper that empathy is most human, find peace in what is fluid. It is all our nature to make vows with the light, to look up at the sky and make ritual of the moon at night. We all want to heal the dignified fight to transform the space between wrong and right in syncopated rhythm. We bloom into a kaleidoscope of universal wisdoms. We are doing more than just all right. We are bursting into flight, proud to be the artist, but we are at our largest when we are the song, reminding one another we are home all along like your fingers laced between mine, bridging moments of space, one silly selfie at a time, nourishing our purpose with undeniable courage. We are doing more than creating life. We are bursting into flight, loading into our unfolding, unapologetically growing, seeing with our own eyes, our private lives are most communal through the shared frequency to thrive. At the speed of virtual yoga, connecting to our inner child like strawberry soda, we are coming home. On the count of one, two, three, connected, we are free. Thank you all so much for having me today. Thank you. And bringing me into the beautiful conversation. I'm running out and getting some strawberry soda right after this. And Got to, strawberry soda. I'm going to count to three. <laughs> Well, I don't know quite where we are in the in the formal program, but I just want to say my deep gratitude right now is with Jasmine and Joshua for all they have given us today, both with their art and about their art. Thank you guys so much. And uh, let me know what happens in Spain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it does, it feels like a, a really, like a great, great blessing. And I'm wondering if you can put again in the chat um, ways to find Jasmine and Joshua and, and their work. Uh, definitely. We'll be sending an email to everyone that's actually signed up for today with uh, links to Jasmine and, and Joshua's uh, websites. Uh, some more to come there. And I just want to echo what Parker shared. I'm just feeling both warmed, heartwarmed. Uh, moved a little bit, uh, well, just very, very nourished and a little bit in awe. Um, uh, so uh, thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Joshua. And Claire, I think it's over to you for the close. Yeah, perfectly summarized, Aaron. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, the, the last part of our conversation is a lovely segue to uh, next month's session, which will be part of the Virtual School World Forum. So the timing will shift a little bit. Um, over to Thursday instead of Tuesday, but the conversation is really centered around journeying with grief, uh, reflections on transformation and impact with 
an incredible uh, collective of social justice leaders and Parker and Sharon um, continuing the, the through line for us. So we hope that you can join us then and just invite everyone to um, come off mute as you leave and join us in expressing our gratitude for our guests today um, and this space for all of us to, to be together and explore art and the relationship to, to ourselves and our work. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank